Well, welcome to Sunday Night Live. This is my handsome husband, Harold. And this is my fine wife, Bev, and we're glad that you joined us. Amen. Hallelujah. As the song says, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Seventy years ago this month, uh, the movie It's a Wonderful Life premiered. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip Van Doren Stern had tried unsuccessfully for years to shop that, you know, as a book. It was called The Greatest Gift. He get somebody to, to publish it, and nobody wouldn't. So several years later, he took and sent, he made it into a 21-page Christmas card. How about that? And sent it to 200 people. Well, somehow in that process, a Hollywood producer ended up with a copy of it and uh, bought the rights to The Greatest Gift, which became It's a Wonderful Life. Right. And in 1946, he paid $10,000 for it. Uh, so that was 70 years ago this month, this month that it came out. Now, the movie was shot during the summer of 1946. And I don't know how many times you've watched It's a Wonderful Life, but we have a number of times for years. We watch it every year with our kids. Mm -hmm. But if you'll notice, there's several scenes in the movie where it's snowing or really cold and mm -hmm. Jimmy Stewart's sweating. It's because they shot the movie in the summer without air conditioning. And that's why he had sweat on his face when they were doing it. Um, but that's kind of movie magic. There you go. Some of the other mm -hmm. movie magic, just as an aside, I like, I like Jimmy Stewart and I love this movie, was Frank Capra, who was the director, was well by known. training an engineer. And he came up with a new way to create snow in these movies. And he took foam from a fire extinguisher and sprayed... Uh, um, cornflakes. Cornflakes. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing they didn't all And that's what they used perish. for the snow in that movie, which is, again, kind of fascinating. It's also interesting that that movie bombed at the box office. Did not do well at all. The first year. Uh, the first year. But over the years, it's become a classic. A classic. And, um, you know, now, and I've told you all this to say this. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is when George Bailey, played by the late, great Jimmy Stewart, one of our favorite actors. Mm -hmm. But there was a scene where he was in, in turmoil. And, and <clears throat> he prayed. He, begins he to said, pray. Dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you could hear me. And then he started crying. Is that the scene in the uh, diner? Yes. <clears throat> I want to say there was another point and about then that. And then he started yeah. crying and then he said, Show me the way. Show me the way. That's what we need to be saying this and every day. That's right. I get glory bumps saying this. Show me the way. Lord, show me the way that I need to go. <clears throat> Not only this Christmas season to make it meaningful beyond gifts that are under a tree, but right. things that we can say and do for others to encourage them. Amen. And what, that just fired when, me up. When he was in that diner, it was not planned for him to burst into tears, but he was so moved by the plight. I don't want to get all fuzzy here. He was so moved by the plight of George Bailey and what was going on that he burst into tears. And back then, cin cinematography is not what it is today. And, and you know, Frank Capra, he wanted that. He wanted that scene. He wanted the pure, raw motion of what happened to Jimmy Stewart that just happened. <clears throat> He wanted it captured on the film. So he had his people work and work and work to be able to zoom in because they were filming it, but they weren't filming it like they were featuring it. So they brought it to life, and that's how it became a part of that movie. But it really has a lot of incredible moments in it that are classic. As an aside, too, when the movie started becoming really famous, it had a copyright for 20 years. Mm. And when the copyright ran out, and it was people, uh, TV stations could use it for free, everybody started showing it and doing it. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's the reason it became so popular and such a classic. Right. But it is a good movie, and there's so many themes at work in them. I'm not reviewing the movie. Right. The thing I really wanted to do was, uh, you know, was, it just stirred in me earlier today, this morning, this morning early about It's a Wonderful Life, in that one scene, show me the way. Show me the way. Timeless, message. Timeless messages. Timeless messages. It does. That. That's right. Now, 
many years ago, the Lord gave me an amazing sermon. Yes. Um, and it came as a result of my fine wife, Bev, and my parents. We were uh, taking a long weekend getaway to the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. We started looking for a hotel room. This is before cell phones. Way before. So if you wanted to make a call, you had to find a pay phone, you know, to, you know, to make the call. We started looking for a hotel room. Uh, we traveled over 60 miles on Interstate 40 going through the western part of North Carolina, and there was nothing available. Now, Clark at the first hotel that I stopped at, again, you know, you either call him on a pay phone or you pull off and stop. He informed me that I was going to have a problem finding accommodations because the annual furniture market was going on in High Point, North Carolina, that and he said there will be a sleeping room available <laughs> in 60 miles either way of this, of High Point, North Carolina. And he was right. Indeed. And like I said, this was before oh. cell phones and computers and Cyrus and modern technology Help and all that stuff. Help me find a place to stay. Yeah. Oh, well, sure. Sorry? What do you need? I need a hotel That's room. It. Can you find it for me? Yeah. yeah. So now, exit after exit after, after exit, exit after exit. And there was no room at the end. That's right. Holiday or otherwise. That's it. <laughs> there just wasn't. That, that experience led me to write a sermon. Um, I think that was in November of that year. I in November of that year. It led me to write a sermon um, that I think really answers a classic timeless question among Christians everywhere. And, and it's, it's simply this. No matter what year you're born in, um, you know, show me the way. And, and the point is this. The title of the sermon is seven what, oh, is, um, what to do. What to do when your star leads you to a stable. What to do when your star leads you to a stable. Now we had the money to pay for a hotel room, uh, but there was not one to be found. And um, it was, it was, <laughs> you weren't about to give birth. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> but we were not expecting what we found exactly. on that trip. I've often wondered how Joseph and Mary must have felt. They had the money. They just didn't have an available place to stay, except for the stable. I'm certain this was not what Mary was imagining would happen exactly. when the angel visited her, advising her that she would be carrying the Son of God. I'm sure in her mind, she never saw him being born in the stable, and, a, and his first crib being, you know, a, a manger. A manger. Um, and she didn't imagine that. She could have never dreamed that he'd be born and placed among beasts of burden. That's right. Or even the smell that had to be in the stable. She'd been uh, given a promise, like we're often given promises, and we've often have things that we're looking to, but we're not given the details. Joseph was not a poor man. By profession, he was a carpenter, a skilled craftsman whose skills were in demand. But regardless of how much money he had or didn't have, That's right. the results were the same. He could do no better for his wife and his soon-to-be born child mm -hmm. than staying in a manger. Couldn't do any better. Yeah. It's Luke 2, verse 7. I love Luke 2. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Jesus wasn't born in a palace uh, with servants attending to every, his every need and desire. Mary didn't even have a midwife assisting with the delivery of the child. Nothing, none of that. The first, point, first people to visit the newborn king were shepherds, who at the time, who at the time were looked down on as outcasts. Mm -hmm. That's not talked about a lot, but if you study that history, that's the way they were considered, uh, outcasts. Scripture says they were amazed by the experience of angels proclaiming the birth, the birth of Jesus. Truthfully, at first, they were petrified. It'd be like an unidentified flying object coming up because they'd never seen it. <clears throat> you know, like a Steven Spielberg movie or something. But they weren't expecting that. Mm. That's right. Luke 2, verses 8 and 9 says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, 
and they were sore afraid. Several translations say terrified, use the word terrified. So just imagine how they felt. It's nighttime. You're watching the sheep. It's dark. You think it's all calm. All's calm. And here comes this bright light and an angel talking to you. Now. That gets your attention. Yeah, in a heartbeat, it would. Um, but the angel spoke. When the angel spoke, everything changed. That's right. That is right. Luke 2, verses 10 and 11. This is in the Amplify Bible. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which will come to all people. For to you is born this day in the town of David a Savior, who is Christ the Messiah, the Lord. Now, if you had had that kind of close encounter, no doubt you'd be getting to Bethlehem just as quick as you could. <laughs> That's exactly what these guys did. Later, kings from the east brought expensive gifts of gold, frank, and certain myrrh. And, and this wasn't a short trip. It took weeks, months, and years right. of extensive traveling for them to get there. I think sometimes we overlook or we don't. When we're reading the story, you know, like on Christmas Day, we read it every year. And you're, and you're looking at this and you read the details, but it's not sinking in what it was like if you had been there. Because it looks like this is just happening kind of out there. And you're going, are you, are you sure this is the way you wrote it up, Lord? I mean, you know, there are times when things happen and you go, did I do something? Was there something that I didn't plan right? Did I not plan this trip well enough in advance? Did I not see the start? You know, all kinds of things. Like when Mary was, you know, about to give birth, I mean, I'm pretty sure that she might have said, are we sure this is exact location that you had in mind when you told me about me having your son here? You know, God has ways in, that are different from ours. And, and sometimes we just can't, you know, think we're in the wrong place at the wrong time. When, it's, when we know that God has our lives, then we know that no matter what happens, he's got a plan. Somewhere in all of that, he's got a plan. Can I tell my favorite story about Reinhard Bunk? Tell it. I know. It, I've told it before, but I just think it is the most amazing thing what God, God is just amazing in so many ways. He just, I'll tell you this one first. And I was telling Harold today, I was reading, I was going, I'm into the Old Testament, which I love. And when, <clears throat> before I tell about Reinhard Bunke, um, when Samuel came and, you know, the Lord sent Samuel, he said to him, go to the city, you know, to Beth, and I want you to have dinner with Jesse, and I'm going to anoint one of his sons to be king of Israel. And so he goes, and he looks at Eliab, the firstborn of Jesse, and he said, wow, this must be the king. The Lord, I mean, speaks to him and said, you know, you look on the outward man, but I look on the heart. This is not the one. And I was telling Harold, I said, he goes through all the sons. But you notice on the way over there to have this dinner, God didn't say to him, hey, by the way, he's not even going to be there. You know, we don't always know. I mean, even though God is speaking to Samuel, he's there with him. He's, you know, God has his ways. And I believe, you know, that David, who was the runt and not well liked, if you want to, you know, really get, he was the eighth of the eight sons out in the shepherd. He wasn't even invited. He was not, um, he was not well looked upon. I think in a lot of ways, you and know. There's a reason for that, but we don't have time to get into it. The thing of it is, is God has his ways and purposes of being able to show that whole family who was really important and who was in charge. When David's pulled in out of the flock, you know, away from the flock, to be the anointed king of Israel, I think that probably put the brothers in a perspective that they hadn't planned on being put into. So I think that God, you know, he does things in different ways that we don't always understand, but he always has a way and a purpose in all of it. Yes, he does. He does. I'll skip Reinhardt. He's a long story. But next time, tune in. Well, that's in. a good story you, you just told. Yeah, that, but that is, to me, that's the way God is. And we overlook these things sometimes of not seeing that, hey, they didn't have, you know, Samuel. I, I think sometimes I'd love to have been Samuel. He's had such a voice with God. He didn't tell him anything, everything. He told him what he needed to know. And that's what he does with us. He tells us what we need to and know. And you just say, show me the way. <clears throat> and that's exactly. And that's, he wants us to be on our knees going, show, show me, me the, the way, way, Lord. Anyway, 
I got, it's interesting that I just came to my mind. Our daughter, <clears throat> oldest daughter, was in a major Christmas production yeah. at her church today, which is Church on the Way. So when Jack Hayford started, and uh, she was in this. It, thanks to technology. We got is, to see it. We got to see it um, on the computer. But afterwards, she was talking with the pastor who yeah. was telling her what a great job she did. And he said, um, somebody else thinks she did a great job and wants to say it, wants to tell you. And she turned around, and it was Cuba Gooding Jr. He goes to the The church. actor who goes to that church. And he said, you were amazing. So show me the way. He said, show me the money, got an That's Oscar it. for it. <laughs> but God says, show me the way, and you get more than an Oscar. You get heavenly direction where you're going. But that was kind of cool for her, <laughs> you know, that that happened. Um, God is very good. But back to the wise men. Amen. We took a little detour, now yeah. we're back. It was an important detour. It's, it's interesting to me, too, and I don't mean to blow anybody's theology or nativity set because we got some here That's right. that has the wise men at the manger. Right. Didn't happen. No. Didn't happen. Two years later, they showed up. That's it. And, and they weren't the right still time. in the stable at just the right time. That's right. Um, and understand these wise men, they, they left their family security, and probably an opulent lifestyle. And no doubt. Went through all kinds of weather, but they were persistent in wanting to find this. The and Christ they followed child. the star. Amen. And, uh, you know, they wanted to see the newborn king. That's right. In Matthew 2, verse 2, it says, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. You know, when they saw the star... You know, just like when Mary got the promise and got over the initial shock, no doubt. They were exceedingly joyful. They were like, this is, this is, and we talk about history making. I mean, you can't get much better than that. And in Matthew 2, verse 10 and 11, it says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Just at the time they were going to need it because mm -hmm. they were getting ready to flee. They were. There are seven things you should know when your star leads you to a stable. First, the star, your goal, the one that you're seeking may first lead you to a stable or a humble place in life. Your journey might not start the way you think or, or may not be going the way you think it should, you might end up taking a different path to the goal than what you imagine. But Isaiah 55, 9. Isaiah 55, verse 9 says, And as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God doesn't see things the way we do. Uh, he understands things we can't. That's why our unquestioned obedience to His commands and His instructions is absolutely essential. Yes. We should never try to figure it out on our own. See, we, the problem is that we often try to bring God's thought process down to ours instead of raising our thought process up to His. Uh, we should be lifting our thoughts into the heavenlies. And uh, what's that scripture in, in uh, 2 Peter one, two, you oh, like? Two, uh, yeah. two, one. It says, um, if you want to know more about God, then get to know Him better and better. Is that the one you say? Yeah, in the and Living which Bible. means read, read, read your Bible and do what it says. And you know, if you're going to do your day, we, t we preach on this all the time. You know, staying in the Word every morning, every day, staying in the Word. Because when you, what happens, like what we were talking about a minute ago, when we get all in the scurry and the hurry of what we're doing down here, then we start to bring God down to our circumstantial level. And what we need to do is start out that day every morning. That's why we love Rich Lots for breakfast. Bringing our mental attitude and ours up to God so that we can think wider, think better, and let the Lord, you know, like we pray every day, that he lead us in the way that we should go and he counsels us with his eye upon us. Psalm 32, 8. So, you know. So, so here's the bottom line. Exactly. We have to make the most of whatever hand we'll deal, knowing that God is the one who raises the stakes Amen. and offers even better opportunities. Even when there seem to be none. That's exactly right. 
That's right. It's, as the old Even saying goes, we... it's not where you're at, it's where you're going. That's right. And where you're going is letting God show you the way. Even if you end up in a stable and you go, what? Are you sure it's that this was... here. Why am I here? Are you sure this was part of the plan? Yeah. That's right. Second. Second. In following your star, don't allow circumstances mm. to hinder you from your objective, even if you end up in a stable. Mary did not think she'd miss God because she gave birth to her son in a stable. And sometime later, she found wise men come to worship him as a newborn king. Even though her his first visitors were the only the lowly shepherds, he was later visited by the kings. That's right. By the kings. The common people found mm -hmm. him first. Matthew 2, verse 10 in the Amplified see, there, Bible. There, there's a significance to <laughs> There this. is to th the, that's the what significance I'm is the shepherds. Shepherds were looked down on, mm -hmm. uh, not viewed, you know, very highly. So you've got those people, and you've got the, the you know, the, you kings. know, the wise men, the kings, right. and they all came to seek him, of That's every right. level. Of every level. But he reaches out to the poor and the lowly. Matthew two ten in the Amplified Bible says, when they saw the star, they were thrilled with ecstatic joy. We need to worship Him in every situation mm -hmm. and at all times because circumstances and facts change. Yes. But the truth of His Word never does. Amen. Never does. Malachi 3, 6. <clears throat> I like this. For I am the Lord, I change not. And if we want a New Testament we can, version we can, of that, we can go to Hebrews 3, 8. This is in the Amplified. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is always the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever to the ages. If God doesn't change, and He doesn't, and He doesn't, if His Word doesn't change, and it doesn't, if God's promises remain the same, and they, and do, they do, then it's fairly obvious that we in our circumstances are the ones that need to change. Mm. Not God, not His Word, not His promises. That doesn't change. But we need to change. And it doesn't matter and how old you And if you complain you about what's going on around you, the way to change your environment mm. is to first change, you know, what's in you. That's it. By, by, by you changing, then your environment changes. Mm. And uh, that's another glory book yeah. statement. And it's, and it's not an easy thing. No, it's not. You know, to not get and, all... Because sometimes you're having to deal with people that frankly need to have hands laid on them three ways. Hard, fast, and continuous, but uh, well, we're none perfect. I know. I know, none, no, not one. And I, I'm just teasing when I say that. By the way, third, when your star leads you to a stable, there's normally one of two reasons why you experience the unexpected. There you go. Uh, it could be that God has given you a mid-course correction to your journey. There you go. You may have started in Egypt, crossed into the wilderness. Morning to reach the promised land, and you will if you stay on course. Following his correction and instruction. You started in Egypt, went through the wilderness, That's you right. get to the promised land. But there was correction along the way. And everybody lives through that. We so, all start in Egypt. We all start in the place where sin abounds. Because that's who we are. I mean, that's what we're born into. And in order to get to the promised land, we have to learn a few things. And that's the wilderness. You know, and the thing, the more, I guess the longer I live, the more I am totally convinced that, you know, we, there are just certain things, you know, that we, we just want it all to be like, okay, I was good today, Lord, where is the reward, you know? I mean, but we are number one, we're not good. We're not going to be good. We, we just never are going to be good. The point of it is, is we are saved by grace. I mean, <clears throat> hopefully we can apply grace, you know, but we weren't the one, you know, being graceful. It was God through us, you know, and as we've said many times too, but not recently, you know, you can't live for God. You have to let God live through you. When we start living for God, when we think we're living for God, then we're into works. But when we humble ourselves and get before him and really get in his presence, and realize how much we need him, then is when he can come in and get through to us. And it says he 
resist the proud. So we don't want to have to be the ones who are saying, hey, God, look at me. I did this. I did that. No, we want to be able to, you know, when he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble person who says, hey, I need help. Hebrews 12, verse 6. This is in the Amplified Bible. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves. And he punishes, even scourges, every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. So if we're not being occasionally pulled over and given a ticket by the Lord, we may be well, not it could running be. in the He's right providing camp. additional <laughs> instructions yeah. so that we can make right decisions on our journey. Amen. We need to. Romans 8, 28. This is also in the Amplified Bible. We are assured and know that God being a partner in, our, in their labor, all things work together and are lifted, are, are fitting in, into a plan for good to those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. We are all fitting together for good. So we all have a purpose. If, if, if one thing's out of kilter, it, the purpose is getting, you know, not getting done. Proverbs 19, verse 20. In the Amplified Bible, hear counsel, receive instruction, and accept correction that you may be wise in the time to come. A failure to receive correction mm. brings unfortunate, unwanted consequences, and truthfully, yeah. can lead us to a place we don't want to go. That's it. Or we don't want to be. We don't want to be. Proverbs 13, 18 in the Amplified Bible says, Poverty and shame come to him who refuses instructions and correction, but he who heeds reproof is honored. Fourth, as you follow your star, you should never give up. <clears throat> mm. It would have been easy for the wise men to say, forget this, I'm going back home. Yeah. I'm tired of living out here in the desert with the cold nights, the hot days, all the wild animals and the other crazy people out here, because I'm sure they ran into some along the way. And, and you see, we also have this image of three wise men or three kings on, on camels. But I guarantee you it wasn't just the three of them. That's they had an entourage with them. No doubt. And you know, people supporting them. People who are living in the kind of comfort they're used to living in, not, not going to be rough in it. And uh, after a while, they may have, see, we don't know this. We'll find out in heaven. Um, but there may be grumbling them in hell. Anyhow, just. Some of the, yeah, servants might have said, hey, we need to turn around. They said, well, let's stay home. Or we're comfortable. Um, and see, we have a tendency to embrace the comfortable. Huh. But breakthroughs never come <coughs> when we're comfortable. <coughs> it's when we move outside our comfort zone and we begin to stretch. That's when. Mm. That's when, when we're we have the breakthrough. Out in the wilderness, yeah. searching and being tried to try and to follow that dream and find it, trying to find that promised land. We need to be out there following the star. That's it. Hebrews 12, 1. This is in the New Century Version. We are surrounded by a great cloud of people whose lives tell us what faith means. So let us run the race that is before us and never give up. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. Some of you here tonight, some of you watching around the world, may feel like giving up, that you're not making any progress, that you've arrived at some <clears throat> smelly, stable, or worse, but don't give up. Don't right. give up. I love 2 Corinthians 4 eight. Yeah, and God always has a plan. It says, this is in the contemporary English version, we often suffer, but we are never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. You may feel like you're under attack, but the Lord is saying, regardless of your current adversity, whether it's relatively, relatively new or it's been around for a while, yep. don't give up. Don't give up. And, and see, we may not know what to do next, but the Word of God says, never give up. Pray about the next step that you should be taking. And sometimes it's the monotonous, the day-to-day, today-to-day, you know, that we have to persevere through that God is looking and there's some powerful scriptures i'm sorry no good there's some powerful scriptures about never giving up yes there really fact, are i've done a couple of teachings on it or we have you know with rich sauce for breakfast you know, either adversity up. or you know the day-to-day -day, there are just so many 
One of them is Luke 18, 1. This is in the New Living Translation. The parable of the persistent widow. Actually, I really love this one. It says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. That goes on. Yeah, that's what I tell you. That is a good one. Yeah, it is. I remember the first time, and it was, it was an amazing experience. I was off doing a seminar, and one night I woke up, and the devil was trying to have a conversation with me, which didn't last. But he said, you're not making any progress. None of these people are getting out of debt. You know, it's just mm -hmm. not happening. And it's like the Lord just brought to my mind. And I said, devil, I'm never going to give up, give in, back up, back down, sit down, quit, or walk away until the body of Christ is out of death. Mm. Now I'm going back to sleep and you can leave. And I roll over and went back to bed. And he wasn't there like Wigglesworth one time woke right. up and the devil was sitting in his room. And Wigglesworth looked at him and said, oh, it's just you. I'll deal with you in the morning. Rolled over and went back to sleep. It wasn't that kind of experience. But it was just real He can to me. only be in one place at one time. Yeah. I'm thankful he doesn't visit. <clears throat> Ephesians 6.18 in the New Century Version says, Pray in the Spirit at all times with all kinds of prayers, asking for everything you need. To do this, you must always be ready and never give up. Always pray for all God's people. Wow, that's a great scripture. By the way, if you've never read the New Century Version, it's a good version. Good translation. Yep. Good one to read. Fifth, when your star leads you to a stable, it's time to give. Mm -hmm. See, many people stop giving in times of adversity, and that's absolutely the worst thing that you can do. The wise men were not moved by what they found, but gave rich, rich gifts to the new king, even though they didn't find him in a palace. Mm -hmm. and they gave him rich gifts. Um, if you got doubts about what you should do, read and meditate. Do as God directs you to do. That's it. And, and I did a teaching two days ago. We did, sorry. Two days ago. Rich sauce for breakfast. And, and, and it was prompted by a lady who wrote me a letter and, and she quoted the scripture in Acts 3 where the beggar says to, uh, no, Peter says to the beggar, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to thee. And some people use that to say that, that Peter didn't have money. Well, that's foolishness. Peter had money. He had his own boat, his own fishing crew, and his family had servants. What that scripture is saying is at the moment, if you look up the word have, you can see it. At the moment, he didn't have money with him. But he was about to give that guy something mm. more valuable than money. Way beyond. Way beyond that. Mm -hmm. So the point is, we need to start where we are with what we got and do what we can. I remember, uh, I will always remember being in Detroit five, six years ago. And I was having a pastor's luncheon. And there was about 40 of them there. And uh, the conversation, you know, I'd said something about tithing. And said, well, we don't, our church, we don't teach that right now. You know, they've because, had a tough, tough, incredibly tough time. Because of all the people who got laid off with the, Automobile oh, industry and, they all went and the related related industries. Right. I said, how many of you stop teaching tithes and offerings now and giving because of that same reason? And of the 40 people in the room, probably 30 of them raised their hand. I said, let me just be frank with you. You may not love me, but you got to like me. I mean, you may not like me, but you got to love me. There you go. And I'm going to tell you the truth. And that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because why would you not teach the one thing that can get people out right. of the financial mess they're in. And that's tithes and offerings. Right. And I'd hate to be you guys answering for this <laughs> on Judgment Day. I mean, wh wh you know, what you're going to do is say, well, be hopeful. No. Give. And, and not only that. The kingdom. Do the, create yeah. programs to help them get a new skill set. Right. And to do other things. But don't sit there and cuss, cuss or curse the darkness. That's right. That's what they were doing. Yeah, and the thing of the the point of the matter is that if God's economy doesn't work, no economy is going to work. That's it. So you know, God's economy is the number one economy, regardless of whether we're living in great times or not living in great times. As it says in Malachi, three verses eight through ten. And this is in the Amplified Bible. Will a man rob or defraud God? Yet you rob and defraud me. 
But you say, see, these priests that he's talking to said, oh, well, things are bad. And we just, you know, we just suspend it for a while. Mm. It says, but, he, but you say, in what way have we robbed or defrauded you? Oh, we had a, we had a good reason, right? Isn't that what they were saying? You have withheld your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and prove me. Now buy it, prove me now, buy it, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. The windows of heaven? That's right. Or at the moment, if you're not tithing, giving offerings, they're closed. But when you start <laughs> tithing, giving offerings, they're open. If you stop tithing one week or two weeks because you don't think you can afford to do it, windows close. Right. So the question is, which is better, open or closed? That's and it. we've taught this before. Open Many times. is much better. And it says in Luke 6, 38, this is also in the Amplified, Give, and gifts will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will they pour into the pouch formed by the bosom of your robe and used as a bag? Boy, holding it up, getting it. Now, this is the important part. For with the measure you deal out, with the measure you use, when you confer benefits on others, it will be measured back to you. So you can give somebody a little bit of something, and God will give you a whole bunch of little bit of somethings. Or you can give somebody something significant, and then he's going to start giving you significant, significant, significant. See, we miss like this. like that. I mean, there's so much of this we miss. I was uh, talking with a pastor. I won't tell you his denomination. And I was telling him that it was important to really understand the Greek and Hebrew. And I said, uh, for instance, you know the scripture that says, your gifts will bring you before great men. Oh, yeah. And I said, most people <coughs> interpret that as skills and abilities. Um, but look it up. I said, but when you look it up, That's right. you see the Hebrew word matan, M-A-T-T-A-N. And matan is in the scripture five times and is always translated as money, precious jewels, and valuables. So what it's saying is your financial gift will bring you before great men. He said, that doesn't seem right. I said, well, Pastor, let me ask you this. When they went to the temple, did they take a gift? He said, yes. I said, if they went to see the king, did they take a gift? He said, yes. I said, up until about 15 years ago, if you went to visit somebody in their home, you took them a gift. That's right. And, and that's, it, it's, it's, it's there. Because society changed, doesn't mean that we change. That's exactly right. <clears throat> God's word, or the word changes. Exactly. The word stays the same. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 I in the this. Amplified Bible said, Let each one give as he has made up his mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion, meaning somebody's forcing you to do it. For God loves, he takes pleasure in prizes above all other things and is unwilling to abandon or do without. A cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. I love this is a one-two punch. <clears throat> it is. Second Corinthians 9 8 in the New Living Translation. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Sometimes it's called standing on the word when you don't feel like you have what you're supposed to have or you can do what you're supposed to do. If God said it, we need to stand on the word. And sometimes we have to persevere. Standing yeah, when the, the scripture word. says stand and stand again, that's <clears throat> not the, that doesn't mean to be passive. If you look it up, that's it, right. it literally means aggressively anticipate. There you go. And it's like the Roman Legion soldiers. We've shared this before. The soldiers that were on the front lines, mm -hmm. you know, of battle, they had special boots they wore. And the boots had spikes. They were about a foot long. And when those soldiers planted their feet, mm. they may be killed, but they weren't going anywhere. And if the army came and they killed them, they had to come over those guys to get back. That's and right. so it gave the Romans an advantage. But those guys on the front line, those about a foot long spike went deep down in the ground when they were holding their formation. 
Mm. That's the kind of standing we do. That's it. When we're waiting for God to manifest what's going on. That's okay. It. Six. When your star leads you to a stable, mm. you can always find God's grace and mercy there. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians twelve nine in the Amplified. But he said to me, My grace, my favor, and loving kindness and mercy is enough for you, sufficient against any danger, and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and complete, and show themselves most effective. Now that's something we could do that's a whole set That's why this is underlined in bold. Most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more glo gladly glory in my weakness and infirmity, weaknesses and infirmities, that the strength and power of Christ, the Messiah, may rest. Yes, may pitch a tent over and dwell upon me. We don't want to feel weak. But you know what? God has to see us. You know, we have to come before the Lord and realize that we just can't do it. God knows how you feel. Mm. He understands your thought process. And not only that, he's watching you. Mm. You know, you're never out of his, you know. That's right. You know, no matter where never, you are. That's never out of his hand. That's never it. Never out of his heart. I look ahead and you're there. I look behind and you're there. That's right. Good. Read that one. Yeah. Psalm of David's Hebrew 4.15, though. I'm going to read Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities, and liability to the assaults of temptation. But one who has been tempted in every respect, as we are, yet without sinning. Take Hebrews, the next one that's on your mm -hmm. outline, and read and study that, but we need to move along because yeah. of time. Uh, seventh, when your star leads you to a stable, you'll find that God is no respecter of person. Isn't that a wonderful And thought? you're going to find something else that we'll talk about right at the end. Amen. And the two recorded visits to baby Jesus we find, as I mentioned earlier, total opposites. That's right. First, there was a visit by the shepherds. And then, and as we said, they were looked down on. And uh, then the three wise men came. It's significant that he was also, you know, and this bears repeating, significant that he was visited by the poor, the shepherds, and the rich. Both rich and poor came to worship him. He will speak to all of us if we just listen and follow the mm. star. Amen. And one final thing. When your star leads you to a stable, you can expect God to give you leadership and direction. Mm. John 16, 13. All right. In the Amplified Bible, but when he, the spirit of truth, the truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the whole full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. Mm. While this teaching has been about following your star, even if it leads you to a stable, we need to point out Jesus wasn't at the stable. Um, he wasn't there. He wasn't there when the wise men got there. We've talked about it. And, and the point is, he's not in the stable. He's not in the manger. He's in our hearts. That's right. And he'll show us what to do, Amen. where to go, and what to happen. Mm -hmm. And when the wise men got there, they were living in a house. That's right. Now, I realize this is contrary to most greeting card companies and, and other folks. But it's what the Word says. And given a choice, I'd rather believe the Word than the world. They have to cover it all in just a little bit of time. I know. Matthew 2, 11. Matthew 2, verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. This shows that Mary and Joseph weren't poor because they could afford a house. And this was nearly two years after the birth of Jesus. That being said, mm. each of us need to follow our star our dream, regardless of where it leads us, as long as the Holy Spirit is guiding our journey. That's right. Now here's the very good news. If your star leads you to a staple, you got to know God is already there and he's waiting for you. 
He's waiting for you. Amen. He's, see, sometimes we think we're going through stuff all alone, and that's because we choose to go through it all alone. Mm -hmm. It's not what God wants. Not what He wants. So if your star leads you to a stable, hey, God's there waiting for you. Amen. He's there waiting for you. We need to be saying, Lord, show me the way. That's it. Show me the way. Hallelujah. Happy week before Christmas to you. Amen. Next Sunday night, uh, we will not do a broadcast. We normally have, don't miss it, but <coughs> Sunday night, we won't do it. Uh, if you want to do it, you, next Sunday night, you can go back and play this one again uh, and let it minister to you again. But uh, we're going to spend time with Mom and Dad. And uh, our babies are not coming until January 1st, but they are coming. We have a new season we're living in. Yeah, we do. But God. Amen. He's on the throne. He is. Hallelujah. I, I was so amused. Our youngest son, Jamie, 25 years ago, we, uh, we attended uh -oh. First Assembly of God Church here. And we'd go home on Sunday nights, and there was a Tasty Freeze, which was like an ice cream shop. And uh, we told Jamie, and we'd say to him, Jamie, where do, you, where do we find God on Sunday nights? Jesus. I, I mean think. Jesus on Sunday nights. He said, at the Tasty Freeze and in my heart. <laughs> he liked that. Tradition. And there was a little boy. He came in the store the other day, and his mom said, where do you find Jesus? He said, in my heart. Yeah. And I love it. Amen. Love it. Merry Christmas to all of you. Make sure you're listening to Rich Sauce for Breakfast this week. Join us. Uh, it'll, it'll, be a, it'll bless you. 8.30 each morning. Uh, you can get the toll. The, uh, uh, toll free. Well, no, no it's, it's not, not toll, toll free. free. The call the number. Call number. By going to heraldherring.com, double clicking yeah. on Rich Sauce for Breakfast. And uh, you can check it out. And um, anyhow, if you've been blessed by the teaching, take your mouse moves to the top where it says, Sow a seed and just ask God. That's it. What seed he'd have you put in the ground? I refuse to use the time that I have with you to try to raise an offering. That's it. I tell you the same thing, whether it's Sunday nights or whether it's seven days a week. I tell you, if you've been blessed by the teaching, Amen. ask God what he'd have you give. That's the way I do it, and that's because I'm not going to use the precious time we got to try to build an offering. We're just I'll let God do that. Amen. So until two weeks, wow, I've never said that, yeah. that I recall. But I'm serious. Next Sunday night, go back and listen to this again. I am serious about that. Is that that's what we'll do, huh? Yeah. Until, until tomorrow morning at 8.30 Eastern. That's right. Or God bless you. on Sunday night. Yeah. God bless you. Happy trails. And keep thinking rich thoughts. We love you. We appreciate you. Merry Amen. Christmas.